How's it going? How you doing? Uh, I just want to know about the lab. If we miss it, do we have to like make it up? For today? Um, maybe, I think tomorrow? When do you have lab? Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. All right, so we're going to talk about that at the beginning of the class because tomorrow is remote as well. All right, so it's 3 p.m. Let us begin. So first things first, everybody saw the second email that came out this afternoon, right? Around 1.50. All right, so tomorrow classes are gonna be remote. So that means there's no lab like there was today. All right, um, just how I can't cancel classes, I can't go over the head of the governor and I'm technically still buried in with my car. So I'm not going to be leaving anytime soon. So I was not gonna expect you guys to go to the ship today and I wasn't gonna expect myself to get to school safely either. All right, so there is no, there was no 540 lab today. There's gonna to be no 540 lab tomorrow. Um, that means that expect an email. I'm gonna think it over what we're gonna to have to do because well, those six classes still need to basically learn the material. Um, and how we're going to do it is going to be its own determination. Um, but going from that next week, you guys are just going to continue on like nothing happened uh, with your schedule. So you're still going to get the same material at the same rate everyone else is because it's kind of a little bit more geared towards uh, your examination schedule. So that way you see the material before your exams. All right. So that is the 540 lab. We are going to be moving on today. Uh, this morning I released all of the quizzes that you've taken so far. You should be able to see all the questions, answers, everything along those lines of why you got things wrong. For the people who did pumps on a sheet of paper, I will be posting those grades shortly. So look to that, all right? Other than that, does anybody have any questions about anything along the lines of admin? No, okay. Let's go into the quizzes. 
So we're going to review the quizzes. Usually we will be doing this after each and every quiz, but because of certain students needed to take the quiz later, um, we're going to basically be uh, doing three quizzes today instead of just one. All right, so it's not going to take long, but it's good to see if anybody has any questions. All right, so the first quiz is valves. All right, multiple choice, some are true, false. All right. Which of the valves listed below will cycle from fully open to fully closed when the handle is turned 90 degrees? The only valve here that is listed to do that is a butterfly valve. All right, another valve that would have done that is what? Ball. Yep, a ball valve. All right. So a gate valve cannot be used to throttle due to what? The eventual wear of the disc causing leak by. All right. And you can determine how accurately open a valve or is open or close. All right, any valve you can determine that. All right, the difference between a relief valve and a safety valve is a relief valve will open and reset at the same pressure, whereas a safety valve will open at a set pressure, but reset at a pressure below that. All right. Regulating valves can be controlled by what means? They can be controlled by anything that is listed here. If you can measure it, we can make a regulating valve. All right. What valve can what valve below can be used to throttle without other valves in the line? All right. The only valve there that is a throttle valve is a butterfly valve. All right. If you had two similar valves in line to each other, what type of valve would it be used in order to throttle? So you have two similar valves. Talking about with gate valves, when you could have one as the fully open, then you could use the other one to throttle. Exactly. One as an isolation and one as a throttle valve. All right. There is a position on the ship that that does happen. So in the picture shown below, the pressure being regulated is the closing force. All right. So we have flow coming from left to right. So upstream is on the left-hand side, goes below the disc and pops out. We can see that we have a line that goes up to below our baffle, below our gasket material here, this black line. And that's gonna be counteracting the spring force and pushing the valve closed. All right, going here in the picture show below, the valve is maintaining what type of pressure? and that's going to be back pressure, all right? So that is the upstream side, all right? Everything else here is not going to be, this is downstream, downstream, all right? And then this is backflow, that is a made up word. That makes no sense, all right? True or false, a bypass valve is used to direct flow around an isolated piece of equipment to allow the continual operation, all right? That is true. If we didn't have that, we would be limited by our meters. We would be limited by equipment that would be broken. All right, and that wouldn't be good. True or false, a swing check valve allows flow in either direction when mounted vertically. That is false. All right, what check valve, if mounted vertically, would allow flow in either direction? What valve would do it? It's not supposed to work that way. We have our swing check. And then what's the other type of valve? That is our lift check. It uses that plug. All right, if it was mounted vertically, that plug would never reset due to gravity. All right, and thus, that valve would allow flow in both directions. All right. Moving on from there, we have multiple choice number 10, which is the packing gland's main purpose is to provides an area where the packing material can be inserted to create a watertight seal around the stem. All right, so looking at this, this is a uh, drawing that I did for the other two classes. All right, so 
we're going to say this black area that I drew out is the bonnet and or the packing material that I drew as number one. All right. We have our red is our disc. Our green is our stem. All right. Going from there, we... Give me one second. So we have our packing material. It's a string-like material. All right. You cut it to length, which is shown here. All right. This is a top-down view right here. If you were to be looking down this way, you have your black outer casing, which is the packing material area. The blue is your packing material. The green is your stem. All right. And where this glitter area that I have drawn right here and here is because you have to wrap them where you're going to be wrapping them once this way and then once on top of it the other way where the split is going to be. So it's 180 degrees away from each other. All right. Then you have this black area up here that I'm coloring in presently. Now, that black material is going to be pushed down on the packing material, creating that seal. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? No. Okay. Going on to quiz number two, piping. All right. So big thing here, guys, is, is that you always have to look out for things that, especially you'll see in the pumping, I may be just writing nonsense. All right. So if we haven't gone over it, more than likely it's not the correct answer. All right. So going to question number one, when creating threads on a pipe, you need what type of tool? That is going to be a tap and die. All right, a union will create a watertight seal due to metal on metal contact. It's a metal on metal seal, all right? The threads on the coupling outside of it is dedicated to create the pressure for the metal on metal seal, all right? If you are confused on that, look to the PowerPoint folder for piping where there's photos of cut in half unions, all right? All right, give me one second. All right, so number three, to make a 90 degree turn with a piping, what type of fitting would you use? All right. The only one here listed that is proper is an elbow. All right. Another thing you could use is a T if you had to be creative. But if you utilize the T and you had your piping going in like that, right? What would happen when you created this? What would happen to the flow? It would go this way, right? But it would fall out right out of the other side of that pipe. You would get your 90, but what would you have to do? Close it off at that end. Say again? Close it off at, the, uh, at that end. So what fittings would we use here on the other end? Uh, a plug. A, use a, a plug. plug? What else could we use? There's another fitting we could use. A cap. How would, but if we have a cap, it's going to be the same outer diameter. How would we attach it? A nipple. Exactly. So we could add another little piece of pipe here with a cap over it. All right. Any benefits of using that instead of just using an elbow? Uh, it really comes down to if you just don't have the parts. All right. So if you don't have the parts for an elbow, you could do this. You could do anything that makes it actually work. 
all right? You may even be able to do two 45s, all right, in order to create that 90 degree. All right, some way, shape or form, you guys are probably gonna run into something like this where you're gonna have to jerry rig something to make it work until you order the right parts, get it in, go to port and fix it. So that way this will be a 90 and will be an elbow. All right, but something like this, I guarantee you in your career, at least once will you have to do it. All right. But all intents and purposes, elbow. All right. When you have to join two pieces of pipe together while one end is connected to the bulkhead and the other is attached to equipment, the only union, uh, the only pipe fitting that you could use is a union. If you use the coupling, you would de-thread one piece of pipe while trying to thread onto the other. All right. You would only be able to utilize a union in this situation. That is what they are designed for. Question number five is a straight memorization. All right. Piping with a diameter exceeding 14 inches is sized by the outside diameter. All right. True or false, nipples can be used to combine two pipes that have internal threads, and that's referring to the pipes. Nipples use external threads to thread into internal threads, so that is true. All right. Question number seven, we have a true false again. When bolting up a flange, you should bolt clockwise. That is false. What pattern should we be using? Star. Exactly, use a star. When the schedule increases, what happens to the pipe? The wall thickness increases, all right? Just like what we talked about when we were going from schedule 40 to 80 to 120, all right? The outer diameter never changed. So when sweating a copper pipe to a fitted, oh, sorry. When sweating a copper pipe to a fitting, flux is used as what? So flux is the, basically it liquefies in that area, it boils off, and it creates a vacuum internal, all right? So when you add your solder to the piece that you're trying to solder, all right, you add it, it melts, it gets drawn into where the flux was sitting, all right, due to that vacuum, and it will create a watertight seal to that joint, all right? And from there, you have a true false, a pipe thread is different from machine thread. The answer to that is true, all right? Any questions on that? <clears throat> All right, last one, pumps. So a double acting reciprocating pump sends out how many volumes of liquid per cycle? That is the answer to that is two. All right, each cycle is a one up and down of the piston, all right? So if you're using a double acting, it means on both sides of the piston, you are moving fluid with it, all right? A Wilden pump is what type of pump that is positive displacement? What is the technical name for a Wilden pump? A diaphragm pump. Exactly, all right? Wilden is the uh, Band-Aid of the diaphragm pump world. All right. To increase the pressure of a centrifugal pump, what can you do? You increase the speed of the pump. All right. You could install a new pump, but for these all intensive purposes, it's going to be increasing the speed. All right. Obviously, if you're going to be going from 60 PSI pump to 120, you wouldn't be able to do that with the same pump, but that is not in the scope of this class. Okay. So, Shut off head on a centrifugal pump. Shut off head being the area where there is a no flow. If we look at our chart, we have our ideal line right there. We have our centrifugal pump line. We have, make that thicker so you can see it. That is the system flow right there. And going from here, we also have our area of what we're looking at, all right? So we have PSI and flow, all right? And in that green spot right there is the 
no flow scenario. All right, so that is shut off head, otherwise known as a no flow because we have no flow. We're up on the straight on the Y and there is no movement into the X axis. All right. So a relief valve on a positive displacement pump will be located where in the system? And that's going to be from the discharge side of a pump to the suction side. All right, we are not relieving the suction side. So that eliminates the first two, all right, from this problem. Going from here, this is a straight Coast Guard question. As I've told the other classes, this one actually came out of my third assistant engineer's license. So you will see this again, I guarantee it. All right, so the answer to that is B, due to these being lobes. All right, going on from there, we have this pump. This is a 3D drawing of a pump, a centrifugal pump at that. All right, letter B is pointing at this piece right here. All right, the only thing that could be is the impeller, all right, for what it is pointing at. Going from there, we have same thing, but asking for letter A. Letter A is pointing towards the eye of the impeller, which other is known as the suction portion, all right? That is the suction port. All right, looking at that, what is, we know B and A, what is E? Is it the discharge? Exactly. E is our discharge. C is what? Uh, casing. That's the casing. That's the casing of our pump. And D, what is that? Suction. Or no. Um, what is it? Uh, hmm. Remember, we have to spin this impeller somehow. The motor or... It's not the motor, it's going to be the shaft. Ah. All right. So some people in the other classes thought this might be the, pla uh, the packing gland or where the packing material is. Uh, that again is out of the scope of this class. All right. So just be aware there, look how many arrows there are here. There's a lot to pumps, but that kicks up in 542. All right, so that's next semester for you guys. All right. So gear, lobe, and screw are all what type of pump? That is a positive displacement. Technically, they are rotary inside of a positive displacement. All right, gear, lobe, and screw are all positive displacement pumps. And then positive displacement pumps will send a fixed volume of fluid with each stroke or rotation of the pump. That is true, all right? Again, they do not care what is happening around them. Like I've said before, a nuclear blast could be going on and as long as the shaft is spinning or the pump is reciprocating, they will be sending out a straight volume. All right. Any questions on that before we begin today's lesson? All right. Let me just kind of set up here and we will start going. All right. So real quick before I forget or if I let you guys go, um, we're gonna be finishing pump operations today. All right, we are going to be having our pump operations quiz on Wednesday. We will be in person Wednesday, more than likely. All right, if not, we will still have our uh, quiz on Wednesday regardless. Make sure you bring your laptops to class on Wednesday for the people that need to take it via paper. I will have paper for you and plenty of extras considering the amount of problems we had in the earlier classes. Um, going from there, the exam number one is going to be still the 10th, okay? That being said, we will have all the material that is going to be completed by today, all right? So everything from the first day of class till today is what's gonna be on the first exam, 
All right, so that's valves, piping, pumps, and pump operations. All right. From there, we have an extra day in the schedule. So the eighth is going to be a semi review day. All right. And I say semi because if you do not come with questions, I will not be uh, doing a what is known as a high school review. Okay. So if you don't come with questions, then I'm not going to be doing anything and I'm just going to start teaching the next section. All right. So make sure you come with questions. You have a week to figure out any problems you have with these uh, material and questions are not, can you go over all of valves? I will not be doing that. All right. So no one has questions or once the questions stop, we'll just start going into fresh water making part two because we're doing fresh water on Wednesday. All right. Sounds good. Sweet. Let us begin. So steam reciprocating pumps. All right. Let's take a look here. We have our exhaust right here and our input right there for steam. All right. This is our liquid end. If we take a look, we have a sliding valve right here. So when we go in, steam can only enter into this one side and then everything in here will exhaust in this direction. All right, and vice versa when this shuttle valve switches. So when it switches, this will flip to the other side. Let's see if I can get it. There you go. So when it flips and we have our shuttle valve go to the opposite direction, our supply does no longer can go to that way. It has to travel across and now go into this side. And again, the exhaust that steam here only can go through and be pushed out in that direction. So that's how our slide valve works right there. All right. So, sorry, I'm giving everyone a stroke. There we go. So that's how we get our fluid to go back and forth utilizing steam. All right, so where on the ship do we utilize a steam reciprocating pump? Said in class last week, it's on the starboard side lower engine room. Where do we utilize a steam reciprocating pump. Would be for the air compressor? It's not the air compressor. Bilge dewatering? It's not for bilge dewatering. Would it be the feed pump? It's going to be the feed pump, but specifically which one, our main or import? Import. It's our import one, all right. So this is our import feed pump. All right, who guessed, in, uh, who guessed the feed pump? All right, nice job, Hannah. All right, so this is our import feed pump, okay. So going from there, we're going to be talking about our turbine driven feed pumps. All right. So think about the engine room. All right. We have a lower engine room right here. This is our shaft that goes aft. All right. So that's pointing aft there. If we have our ladder well here. All right. Going down. This is our main condenser. with a door right here that leads into the engine room. All right, is everybody getting, or whoops. Everybody getting oriented right here of where we are. We have our two auxiliary condensers. Okay. Over in this area, we have our four AC refrigeration systems right here. We have our import and then right here and right here, 
Both are our main feed pumps. This is in lower engine room? Yep, lower engine room, starboard side. All right, this is the main door you guys are gonna be entering for all of your watches. All right, go into there, you go into auxiliary machine space. All right, so those are your main feed pumps. We have a picture of it in a second, so that way you guys can see it. So our turbine feed pumps are driven by turbines, all right, because we do have a lot of steam. Again, like we, anybody who had me for 540 lab this past week in one of my little groups, all right, you probably heard me say it a bunch of times. We have so much steam, we don't know what to do with it, and we produce so much of it that we utilize it for everything we do. All right, it's just like an, uh, a diesel electric. Why they're driven so much on motors is because they have so much electricity. All right, we have so much steam, we utilize turbines whenever we can. All right, so we have our steam supply, goes into our turbine, and of course our steam exhaust. Now, we have our suction, this is coming from our DC heater. All right, and we have our discharge. And we have two discharges if anybody sees. We have our auxiliary and our main. Now, these two split off of the exact same line. Is there any difference between them? Would we have any difference in either one of these lines in their water quality of where they go? They're splitting off of the same pump. Would there be any change in water quality between the two of them? No. No. So they're exact same water. They're both feed water. Where, where's their end location? If we remember our steam water cycle, our basic steam water cycle, where's the next step after our feed pumps? Where do they go? Who's pulling out the mug book? Next step after our feed pumps, where do they, where does our feed water end up? The economizer? Goes into the economizer. All right, what comes right after the economizer? Back to the boilers. Goes right into the boilers. All right, so these end up pretty much in the exact so, same location. So why would we split both of these things? What's so important about having two dedicated lines going into our economizer and thus the boiler? Why would it be so important that we'd split it into two different lines? Is you have a failure in one line? Exactly. All right. So the only main difference between these two is the main is technically a regulating valve. All right. So if we have any casualty, we don't have to deal with automation. We can just open up a valve and flood it with water. Okay. It's so vitally important to make sure our boiler always has water in it. All right, that we have two dedicated lines to it coming out of the exact same scenario. We're gonna go into depth on this and steam, but just remember the big thing with feed pumps, especially our feed pumps, we have a main and an auxiliary. They are both the same water. They both go to the same place, but our main has a regulating valve on it. Okay. We'll get into the hows and whys and everything else that you would want with these later in the semester. Economizer. Someone coming in? What's an economizer? What's an economizer? All right. So basically the economizer before it goes into the boiler is the area where really quickly, this is your boiler right here, right? Let me uh, draw it how I want to. This is your boiler right here. 
All right. We have our four burners in this corner. All right, producing flames. And we have what is called a steam drum up here. Now, before that is where the actual feed water gets inserted. Before your feed water goes into your boiler, it goes through the economizer. All right. And the economizer is going to draw a whole bunch of tubes. All right. Is basically a whole bunch of tubes like that, where it's not necessarily on the outside of the boiler, but it's no, it's not producing steam. So as the boiler flames are in here and they're making, you know, steam in, in your actual boiler. Well, after they go past, your steam drum, all that smoke and soot, all right, it still has a lot of energy to give. And your economizer will basically, it's preheating any of the water before it goes into the steam drum, all right? So all we're doing is, is increasing our efficiency by utilizing our actual uh, soot and exhaust and everything like that to the best of our ability. So that way we can put hotter water into our steam drum. That's the whole point of the economizer, all right? It's just preheating the water with exhaust gases. All right. Uh, I didn't see who lit up on that, but does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yep. All right. So, all right, we're going to be talking in depth about the lube oil system of a feed pump, and you'll see why in a second. All right. Does this picture make sense to people where we are, where I described it in the engine room? Starting to make more sense of what's happening? All right, so as this disappears, we can still see where everything is on our feed pump. All right, and from there, if we look onto the, should be the next photo. Okay, okay. Okay. All right. So if we look over here, we still have our main and our auxiliary discharges for our feed pump. All right. So this is our discharge right here with both discharge lines of main and auxiliary. Okay. Now we have a new word of the day, which is OS trip. All right. Does anybody know what OS trip would stand for? It's okay if you don't, not anybody would really know where this is coming from. I would just like to see. All right, so OS basically stands for over speed. All right, now no one really writes it as or says it, OS, you know, OS trip. Basically, everyone will just call it the overspeed trip. All right. But to save writing, everyone will write it that way. All right. So it's almost like saying PSI. All right. No one says pounds per square inch. Everybody understands it's PSI. All right. But it's the opposite direction. That is written OS. It's always just by said overspeed. Now, Anybody have an idea what trip would mean in this instance? It'll stop the system if you go over a certain RPM. Exactly. So there's different things for tripping. All right. And tripping is an engineering term. And basically it is that if it starts to spin up at too high of an RPM, it will trip it offline. And the importance of that is it's basically a safety measure, all right? If you have a seriously locked up computer, all right? Blue screens, control out, delete, doesn't do anything. Uh, the force quit on the Apple computers, I don't even remember what it is. It doesn't work, right? Your mouse is locked up. What do you do? Plug it out. You unplug the computer, you hit that reset button, right? It's the same thing for our trips. It's just an automated version of it, all right? But the only difference between a reset button is, is it only kills power. It doesn't bring it back online. All right. So a trip will kill whatever power it is. Our trip is going to be killing our steam pressure coming in. 
all right? And there's multiple different trips out there, electrical versions, stuff for diesel generators and everything like that. We're not gonna get into them, but this is just the big one right here. So let's talk about our regulating system. And surprise, surprise, it's going to be a regulating valve. All right, these come bite back to bite you. So a couple little things right here of what we need to talk about. All right, we still have our steam supply. So we're going to be regulating our steam supply, but our input is going to be our feed pump discharge pressure. All right, so that's what we are measuring, but we are controlling our steam pressure to control our feed pump discharge pressure. Okay, so that's where we have to think this through. So we have an input of feed pump discharge pressure that is coming in right and filling up. That's a terrible color. Why didn't I learn my lessons the first two classes? So that's gonna fill up that void. All right, we have a spring right here and we have a pilot valve over here. All right, this red piece is connected to our black baffle line just like a regulating valve, all right? We have our lube oil supply. This is coming from a lube oil pump. And we have a lube oil return that is going to basically a sump, a tank, all right? Low pressure lube oil. So if our pressure increases, all right? Our pressure increases below the spring, what's going to happen? Hey, ignore this, we'll talk about that later. It prevents your lube oil supply from getting into the system. It's going to, yes, but what's going to specifically happen? Is it going to raise or lower? It's going to raise it. It's going to raise the pilot valve. All right, everybody see how it's going to overcome the spring pressure. All right, and also what Brian said is the lube oil supply is going to be cut off. All right, the pilot valve has now shut off our lube oil supply only to our control valve, not to the whole thing. All right, this is just to the lube oil so, um all right, control circuit, all right? So what happens is, is we take a look at this operating cylinder. This black piece up here is a piston. It's connected directly to our valve, all right? So if we now have our operating cylinder full of lube oil pressure, well, it wants to go somewhere. So we followed along and it has somewhere to go. It's a low pressure area, which is our lube oil return. All right, so that means our piston is going to sink in this system. And if we have a gate valve, that gate valve is going to close. All right, it's going to start to close. All right, does everybody see if we have a really high pressure, all right, on our discharge side of our feed pump? If we lessen the amount of steam going into the system, we will now decrease the speed of the turbine. And because it's a centrifugal pump, we will decrease the speed of our pump and decrease our pressure. So you're saying this is like a self-regulating valve? It is. All right. It's exactly what that is. We have our regulating valve. What we are actually physically regulating is our steam supply, but we are invertedly, and our ultimate goal is to create a certain amount of pressure for our feed pump. All right, so that's why we are, our input is our feed pump pressure. Okay. And it works in the opposite direction too. Let me erase everything on this slide. If our feed pump pressure decreases, same thing's gonna happen, right? We have a spring that's gonna overcome our feed pump pressure. Our pilot valve will shift downwards to allow a lube oil supply to come in. All right, so now we have a positive pressure, uh, pump pressure coming in and it's gonna force that piston upwards. And thus it's going to take the piston and open up our valve. All right, that's our disc. Does everybody see how those two different scenarios have formed there? How monitoring one thing, we can make it correlate and 
deal with whatever is at hand with our steam pressure. All right. Now, last thing on this. Overspeed trip drops operating piston and shuts off the steam flow. So this is the most mechanical thing here. All right, we have a liquid here, a lube oil liquid, correct? That's under pressure. Now this lube oil trip, if it is tripped, we now have an open valve and it's just gonna dump lube oil into our lube oil return, all right? And it will shut our supply. So we'll cut our electricity, we're gonna cut our steam. And now we're gonna slow down our turbine because you have nothing that's gonna be powering it, okay? This is like tr the overspeed trip on our feed pump is exactly like a bathtub drain, all right? Or if you're on a sink with a plunger, all right, you have your, the, the thing, the stopper. You fill your sink up with fluid, you turn your sink on max, right? It doesn't matter what's going to happen with the max water flow coming into it. We can have lube oil pressure all day coming in here, just like the sink being at full blast. As soon as you pop open that plunger, it's all going down that drain and it's not gonna be able to keep up. That's the same thing here. We just attach the valve to that pressure. Okay, does everybody see that lube oil trip? Oops. All right, now last thing, how do we control it? And we go back to the thing that I told you to ignore. All right, relaxing the spring. So this is a reach rod, all right? Basically it's a valve handle. I'm gonna draw in a valve handle because the other classes got confused by the way that arrow was going. So if we turn that valve handle to the left, we loosen it. The valve handle will go up, right? Because we're loosening it. So what happens to the spring pressure if we loosen a valve? Uh, if we loosen that stem, that reach rod, what would happen to that spring pressure? Would it get tighter or will it become extended? It'll extend. It'll extend. It won't be as hard to push down. And if anybody doesn't believe me, pull your pen apart, grab a spring in from the pen and squish on it. All right. So if we relax this spring and we give it more area to go up and down it, all right, we take some of the tension off of it. Will it be easier or harder for the pump to counteract that spring force? Harder. <clears throat> it's going to be easier, all right? Because if it's easier, if you take off pressure from that spring, if you push up on that spring, it will be easier to push up on it and to counteract the force, all right? Because we're giving it more area, all right? So that's how we can also deal with this. That's how we can create a set point. So if it's easier, we can also lower our pressure coming out of the pump, all right? So it's the same thing here. If we have a feed pump discharge pressure of 600 PSI right now, all right? But we wanna to go to 550 or even 500 and we take two turns, loosen the spring. All right, these are made up numbers, by the way, this isn't true to what we do on the ship. But if we take two turns and we loosen it and we made this spring a lot easier to push. Well, if we're sitting here at 600 PSI, wow, that's a lot easier to take off some spring pressure. This is going to push upwards, all right? And the exact same scenario is going to play out that we described earlier, all right? We're gonna be pushing up on our pilot valve all of the lube oil here is gonna start flowing outwards, all right? And we're gonna drop and close our steam pressure, which will result in a lower discharge pressure of what we want to achieve, all right? So that's how we can control this. That's how we can deal with this by using a reach rod. 
And the same thing will happen in the opposite direction. So if we tighten the spring, it will now make it harder for the pump pressure to overcome it, correct? And if that does, say we have, we're sitting at 500 PSI and we want 600. Again, if we take it in two times tighten on our spring, same thing happens. We now have, it's harder to overcome it. All right, so 500 PSI isn't able to come over the tighter spring that we have, we have put in here. So it pushes down, the spring overcomes the pump pressure and the lube oil supply goes in and fills this open. And now our valve has opened up and allowed more steam to come in and we reach a 600 PSI that we were uh, trying to find. Okay, so we can have our automation, but we can also have some input to that automation for a set point via the reach rod. All right. Any question on this? Again, this is really the first system where we're having real life examples of what our regulating valves do. What our lube oil systems, you start putting pumps, piping, positive displacement fittings, cylinders, everything like that into play. And you can start to create systems that are automated. All right, and this is very mechanical. We just don't have a sensor sitting here and reading the discharge pressure and then having a solenoid valve opening up and closing and regulating the steam pressure. This is a mechanical device. All right, understanding this is key to understanding all of what's happening with electrical and all the automation you see today in today's new age ships. All right, it's happening in the same way, but in an electric version of it. Wait, so where's the actual pump on this? So this just operates on uh, discharge pressure? So this operates on, what do you mean? Uh, lube oil pump or the pump of the feed water? So I see a valve, right? And this whole system is presumably to regulate the valve, right? But does this system just operate on discharge pressure? The, uh, the discharge, it operates on the discharge pressure of our feed pump. Okay. All right. So the feed pump is what's going to be inserting our discharge pressure. Whereas we have a lube oil supply pump down here that adds lube oil to all the bearings and everything like that. And it's also a part of our regulation here. All right. It actually uses two pumps. So yeah, we go backwards. All right. So we have our regulating valve. We can see that system where we're sitting here. All right. So these are our lube oil pumps right here and here, which is adding lube oil to our different bearings and our shaft. And one of them comes off and goes to our regulation. All right. And this recirc line comes off and goes to our regulating pressure. All right, so that's how we get the discharge of our pump. That's our blue line right there. And then we also have our yellow line, which is our lube oil. That goes to our system right there. All right. Okay, I see how this works. Okay, good. All right, piping systems. So this is the first time a lot of you have probably seen a tracing. So this is a specific tracing to some sort of fuel oil transfer on a ship. All right, so looking at it, there's a couple of things that we can note. All right, we can see all of our valves. We can see our pumps. We can see relief valves, all right? And we can also see piping as in designated by lines. All right, and the big takeaway right here is, is that this is a plate tracing. All this cares about is components and their order, okay? This is a roadmap of your components, but it's not drawn to scale, all right? So the distance between piping 
All right, so from this strainer to this pump, it could be 24 feet, it could be three inches, it could be a foot, it doesn't matter. It's not drawn to scale, all right? The distance here could be in real life, let's say 24 feet, and the distance between here to here can be one foot. See how they're almost drawn to the same lengths? But it doesn't matter. We're not interested in length of pipe. We are only interested in actual components. All right. Again, we can also see here that we have an elbow right there. There's a 90 degree drawing right there. That may or may not exist. We don't know. We don't care either. All right. So if elbows and things like that, those types of fittings, we don't care about. This might even have like five or six elbows that come between these two things. They're not drawn here. It's a straight line. All we care about is if there's piping in between them and which way the flow goes. All right. We have a T right here, but that T in real life may be something like this. All right. Where flow goes into it in a couple different directions, but it's drawn as a T in this instance. Okay, so all this is showing is where piping connects, in what order, and where's the components in that piping. All right, last thing to note is, you can see it right there, just barely, but I will draw it bigger for you so you can see it. It's a hump like this. What this hump recognizes is, is that those two pieces of pipe do not connect, all right? That's what those signify. This line right here and this line right here do not connect to each other due to that hump, all right? And that's drawn where I'm drawing the letter A. Okay. That's a quick question. Yep. You have access to like a key or something for where we could get like all the symbols. Cause when I had to do drawings on previous boats, like it's pretty hard to find this stuff online for like specific equipment. So every, so if you look to blackboard guys on the important information, there's the standard symbols for tracing. All right. That is what you can use that and you'll be able to do every single uh, component on our ship. All right. And if you're in a spot where like you could see with this, it using a, uh, you know, we have a simplex strainer right there. And this one is a, uh, there's other ones, uh, other tracings that we'll have on this PowerPoint that we've in this class are saying that that is a duplex strainer. All right. But some of these tracings that we're going to see today won't utilize that symbol as a duplex strainer. All right. So if it's not, on the standard symbols or what they utilize, a lot of ships will have in their manuals a standard or a legend in the manual itself. All right, if they don't, then it's utilizing the standard symbol. Most of the time, these are gate valves. That's a rotary pump. All right, uh, where's the check valves? There they are. There's a check valve right there. These are your manifolds. All right, so things like that. All right, but for this class, you're expected to use the standard tracing that I've posted to Blackboard. All right, so let's talk about the fuel oil transfer manifolds. All right, I told you I'd bring it up later. So a fuel oil transfer manifold, we have three plates that go in a almost vertical direction and they're blocked off on each side. So now we have two chambers, chamber one, chamber two. All right. Going from there, we have horizontal dividers along the bottom. These horizontal divide, <coughs> excuse me. These horizontal dividers utilize um, different, go to different tanks. All right, so each one of these, so that's tank one, tank two, tank three, tank four. Each one of those will have a pipe that goes off to a singular tank, all right? Now, both sides of the top section will have valves on them, all right? And these are the, 
actual one. So this goes off to tank one, again, two, three, and four. All right. We have a fill side. So the left-hand side of our plate going down the middle is our fill. The right-hand side of that plate is our suction. Vice versa, sorry. Our fill is on our right, suction's on our left. All right. Now, this is where it gets interesting. So if you want to suck from tank number two, this is what's happening. You open up tank number two's valve where the red arrow is. All right. And you start pulling a suction. Well, the fluid comes up from tank two. It fills this whole entire void down here. All right. That entire lower box for tank two is filled. All right. That whole thing. All right. Now, when it comes up, it's going to go up into this full section. So this entire fill side is going to fill up, but it's not going to go to any of the other tanks because tanks one, three, and four, their valves are closed. All right. So let's say it goes out to a pump. It goes into four because tank four's valve is open. It goes down below into this void down here, fills that up and goes off into tank number four. All right, does everybody see how we can use this fuel transfer manifold to our advantage? Makes life very easy. Yes. All right, so looking at a generic fuel transfer manifold, all right, if we wanna suck from that tank that has been highlighted red, the red dot, all right, following our guide, we can look that we can go across, down, over, if I could draw a straight line, up and over through a strainer into a pump. All right, so that's what we are going to be utilizing there. All right, once we hit that pump, we're gonna go on to the discharge side and we can send it anywhere we want. All right, we're gonna choose that tank on the I think that's the port side. All right, so it goes through the pump, comes out, goes down through another valve, through another valve into our manifold and out to our tank. All right, so that's how we can transfer fuel from one tank to another. Maybe we're going from a, day ta uh, a settling tank to our day tanks, all right? Now, this is where it actually will get interesting on our filling, all right? Again, I've talked about this before, but if as a shipboard engineer, your job is to manipulate your surroundings, all right, to the best of your ability and to the restriction of your piping. But a lot of the ship designers that are out there will give you a huge amount of options, all right? And those options are what really gives a good ship a good ship. It allows you to do things if you get creative. And that's what we're gonna see here. So we're gonna be filling from our deck connection. So we're taking on oil from a barge, all right? So we're coming down, go across, and we start to enter the system. Pretty easy, right? We opened up two valves, and now we're going to be filling our tanks. Pretty good, right? But what if we wanna fill them quicker, all right? We're on a schedule. We need, you know, time is money, especially when you're at the dock, all right? Especially when you're fueling. When you're fueling, you're not doing anything else. You're not doing cargo, you're not doing anything. All right, so that's wasted time for money, all right? So we can get creative and send fluid back through. And now look, we are going to be sending oil from our deck connection into our, what was that? That was our suction side, which we have now created the to be a fill side. So now we're double sending oil to these tanks utilizing just a little bit more piping. And very easily with two more valves, we open up and we can fill both sides at the exact same time, at the exact same rate. All right, this is creativity that will give you a leg up. All right. Next, we have bilge, ballast and fire mains. So we have a new word right here, sea chest. Who knows what that is? 
where you take water from the sea. Mm -hmm. It goes into the fire. It goes into the fire mains. All right. So specifically, a sea chest sticks up out of the deck. All right. This is you, the engineer, standing right here. All right. Looking almighty. It comes out of the deck. It will probably go through a duplex strainer. All right. And then off to a valve. And that will go to whatever component it needs to be. Maybe it's your saltwater cooling. Maybe it's your fire main. Maybe it's your ballast system. All right. But most important to understand is this is a sea chest. So what's right underneath you, right underneath your deck plates in the, in the bilge is, is the ocean, right? So this area fills up with seawater. All right. And that is your sea chest. This thing right here is your sea chest. Okay. All right, so going from there, we have two different manifolds that we're looking at. We have, oh, that's a terrible color. Go back to red. All right, before we do that, take a look. We have one that has a half moon, and over here, one that's a full circle. All right, and here's our big difference. We have a build manifold, which utilizes the half moon symbol. All right. Take a look at what type of valve we are utilizing here. So if we start to take a suction, the low pressure up on top that's created by a positive displacement pump, all right, is creating a vacuum. It's going to create a low pressure. It's going to draw fluid up and through that valve. All right. And it's utilized as a check valve. So you can even keep this open if it's always a problem, and you'll never have to worry about backflow going back into it, all right? So if you always have to suck from, let's say this is, you know, port forward bilge manifold in the engine room, it just, it just leaks all the time, all right? You can keep that valve open all the time, suck from it whenever you want to. You just have to go up to the pump, open up that valve, uh, op start up the pump, and it takes away some work from you. And you don't have to worry about flow coming back and listing the ship one side to the other, all right? So it utilizes a stop check sort of function. Now, if a ballast is what you want full control and you want these tanks to be secured when you're not utilizing them because they're filled with seawater, all right? Because we're trying to ballast the ship down. We have a certain ride height that we need to be at and maintain, all right? And sometimes we need to be low in the water. Sometimes we need to be higher in the water depending on our cargo, all right? So the nice thing about these is that you have full control. If you open one, it's going to be open. When you close it, it's going to be closed. And you don't have anything that you have to worry about as long as you are in control of your valves. All right. So that allows flow in either direction. All right. So if you go through, you can look through this entire piece of work and see how we can utilize different connections, different ballasts and how these systems kind of become intermingled sometimes. All right, so our bilge, our ballast, and fire main, we're sucking from our bilge <clears throat> right now. We're going through two different manifolds to a bilge pump into an oily water holding tank. All right, now, if we wanna do our ballast, we can send our ballast maybe from a different connection. So maybe we're coming from a tank over there and we want to deballast so we can take it and send it overboard. All right. Or what we can do is we can send it to our uh, ballast tanks forward. Oh, come on. Our ballast tanks forward and do maybe a ballast changeover. All right. Go from one ballast tank to another. Or we have our fire main. When we want to charge our fire main, we can go through the fire pump and to the entire fire main there. That's super weird. All right. Well, I froze. Give me a second. Is the quiz uh, next week going to be like uh, another like 10 questions or is it going to be like 20 or something like that? Yeah, give me one second. I got to shut down PowerPoint for some reason. It's there we go. All right. <clears throat>
So, quiz Wednesday. Wednesday the third, all right? It's gonna be normal 10 questions on pump operations, all right? Now, the test. I haven't decided how many questions. Could be 50, could be 75. I'm in between both. Um, you guys have, at this point, all the information ready for that test. So you have a full week and a half before you are going to be taking it. All right. And you have a full week to study for a review. All right. But only if you guys bring questions. All right. So Wednesday the 3rd is going to be freshwater generation and a quiz on pump operation. The Monday the 8th is going to be uh, a review if you guys bring questions. If you don't, that's your choice. Uh, if you don't bring, I'm just going to go right on to freshwater generation part two. Wednesday the 10th is your first examination. All right. It will not cover freshwater generation. All right. And you will not have a quiz on Monday the 8th, no matter what happens on Wednesday. All right, I'm not gonna do that to you. All right, any questions? Where are the keys for the sea chest? You'll have to find them when you get on cruise. <laughs> All right, anything else? All right, like I've said in previous classes, make sure if you are not getting the grades you want on the quizzes, Change your studying, all right? Change how you study. If you are getting good grades on the quizzes, continue that, but be warned, I'm probably not going to be utilizing those questions. Just because you have 40 questions right now doesn't mean that I'm just gonna give you another 10 for this test, all right? I probably won't be utilizing any of those questions, okay? But make sure you study them so that way you know what you got wrong, why you got them wrong or if you got them right, why you got them right. Just because you got lucky isn't a right question. All right. So make sure you study up and you guys have, you know, if you haven't already, go enjoy the snow, at least today or tomorrow. So to the other classes, the quad is an excellent place to have a snowball fight. All right, and enjoy the rest of your day. Sounds good, Professor, have a good one. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, professor. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have a good Have one. one. Have a good one, Professor. So if we have lab on Wednesday, we still go to that, right? Even yes. though the other ones are messed up. Yep. Follow follow your normal schedule if you're on Wednesday. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Have a nice Wait. day. Professor, did you see my uh chat from when I first got in here? Yeah, that your Wi Fi wasn't working? Yeah. I I ended up getting to work in the middle of the thing, but I just started on my phone. Okay. Uh, if you missed anything, I'm posting this to uh, YouTube, so you can still watch this. All right, yeah, I think I just missed the first quiz you, that you went over. Okay, it was just valves. Um, the uh, big thing is, is that if uh, you have any questions or anything like that, you can always ask me. Um, the other part is, is that we're going to be going over all the quizzes pretty much after everyone's taken it. All right, so... The reason we had to stack up so many is because a couple students had uh, taken them late. All right. And it just took a little bit to get ready. So now pretty much after every class, like next Monday, we're going to go over a pump operations quiz. All right. So that's the only thing you missed in the beginning. All right. And I also know the question, why did, what, like for the, uh, the one thing that we were dealing with, uh, like the automatic regulating valves. Mm -hmm. Why, why is there a reason that you guys like we use blue oil instead of like any other liquid or anything? So believe it or not, lube oil is used even to this day on diesel engines for its, um, for everything with its regulations, how it regulates its pressure and everything like that. Um, even it's like, um, pretty much every single trip on a diesel engine, even to this day will utilize dumping the lube oil to the sump to actually